The apostles left the Sanhedrin, rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day, in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. So sometimes in conversation with someone, you may reference someone else and and use the term institution. And when you do that, it's not always a flattering term. But I'm happy to say that today uh, we have an institution returning to us. Dr. Daryl Del Hussey is the president and CEO of Phoenix Seminary. He's been been coming here and uh, and regaling us uh, with scripture gymnastics, as I like to refer to it. Uh, for almost 15 years now, and we have him back here today with us. He is, uh, uh, has an encyclopedic uh, knowledge of Scripture. For those of you who are 40 or younger, that's Wikipedic, if you will, uh, <laughs> knowledge of Scripture. So please welcome Dr. Daryl Del Hussein. Thank you, Ben. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, I uh, remember the days that someone else would go ahead and have the pulpit up here, but... I'll pull it up, maybe hurt my back, but that's the way it used to be done. No, good morning. I understand you are in a study of the beginning of the church, the book of Acts. And uh, I was told that I get to do the section, the discussion on persecution. Oh, that should go over really well. So uh, this might be the last time I'll be invited to speak to you. So I want you to know it's been a wonderful 15 years. Thank you for, for the privilege. There, there are statements in the Bible that I do not necessarily like. <laughs> I, I'm not saying that they're not true. I just wish they weren't true. Um, like I'm not that excited about the turn the other cheek thing. There's times I just want to bust somebody's chops, you know. I, uh, what Peter says that, now men, live with your wives according to understanding. Now I got to be careful here because my bride's right here in front of me. But, you know, at least he doesn't say understand your wife because God never commands us to do the impossible. But then I'm not too excited about Paul's statement here that he gives to Timothy in his second letter when he says, all who wish to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. I mean, that's like anybody with a tooth will eventually end up with a root canal. I I don't look forward to this persecution thing. And why does it have to be true? Is it true? But, but, if it is true, I would like to know, well, then what am I supposed to do about it? Was the early Christians persecuted? Did believers in the first century and so suffer at the hands of unbelievers? Well, that answer is a whopping yes. Well, when did it actually begin? (laughs) It began with Jesus. In John 15, Jesus said, hey, when they hate you, what are you surprised about? Remember, they hated me. They they crucified him. Now, why why would they hate us? We're the good guys. Well, why would they hate him? Did you read the Gospels? Jesus did nothing but good. He loved. He cared. So where's all this hate come from? And why would they do what they did to him? And why do they do what they do to Christians. And so persecution began. And it kicks off right here in the book of Acts chapter 5. And notice how it begins, verses 17 and 18. Luke, the historian writes, gives us the account. Then the high priest, that would be Caiaphas at this time, and all of his associates, well, those who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. Take note of that. It always comes down to jealousy. They arrested the apostles and they put them in public jail. So here Caiaphas, the high priest, and all his cronies gather together and they're afraid. This jealousy, they're they're afraid they might lose some of the influence they have in the different religious positions they have. They've got to shut this thing down. This Christianity, this new church thing. And it does look like Satan has the upper hand here, but remember something. The best Satan can do is give God more opportunities to deliver. And so every time he takes a shot at the church, God gives another delivery if we only keep our eyes wide open for it. Well, the account goes on, verses 19 and 20, and it says, but during the night, so they're in jail, but during the night an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. 
Go, stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new, this new life. Well, basically, heaven, the heavenly uh, visitor shows up, and he gives them the orders and kind of says, now, let's get out of here, and let's get back to doing what I told you to do. And it's interesting, this, this angelos, this angel, this, this being, spiritual being, doesn't say, now, get out of town and run for it, but he says, stand and speak. Take your stand. Don't be backing down. But they're in jail. Well, that, that's what's kind of funny. So notice what happens, verse 21. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts. And as they had been told, they began to teach the people. Well, when the high priest, Caiaphas, and his associates arrived, they had called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel. This is the highest uh, uh, legal court in Jerusalem. And he sent the captain to, to go to the jail to get the apostles. Uh, verse 22, but on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there, so they went back and reported. Well, we found the jail securely locked with the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now, right there, the officials are thinking about their own execution for failing at their post. But I mean, can you picture, they're there, the door's still locked, and these guys are gone. I mean, just think about it. It's kind of one of those multi-dimensional things. All of a sudden, the guards are just... <laughs> and this angel walks these guys right out, relocks the door. I don't know how it happened, but there they, they are, and they're a little bit concerned. So it says in verse 24, on hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. What's going on? Then someone came and said, hey, look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. So meanwhile, Caiaphas has gathered his whole group together here, and he wants to bring the apostles out of jail for a trial. They're going to put a trial on these guys, and they're gone. No one's home. And so what happens? They hear that there they are. They're doing what they're not supposed to be doing. They're, they're at the temple courts preaching Jesus. And so they're not real happy about this. So verse 26, at that the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared the people would stone them. So here are the apostles giving this great the gospel. It's resonating with people, but, but these poor guys got to arrest them again. They do it very gently. And so apparently the apostles cooperate. Verse 27, the apostles were brought in and made to appeal before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by Caiaphas, the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and you are determined to make the, us guilty for this man's blood. Now, interesting here. Peter says, uh, let, let, let's put this whole thing in, in, in context. You said, do not be witnesses of Christ. Jesus said, be my witnesses. Who are we going to obey here? Uh, they, they, they make the charge, well, you disobey our authority by proclaiming this Jesus. And then notice the final charge. He says, you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Isn't it amazing when you've been incited to rage how you could forget things? Because back in Matthew 27, verse 24 and 25, when basically Jesus was being on trial and Pilate was hesitating because Jesus is a nice guy. He hadn't done anything deserving death. And it was these same religious leaders who incited the people to say the dumbest thing. Well, then whose blood should be on, on, on their head for the death of this Jesus? And they were the ones that said, let his blood be on our head. Let his blood be on the head of our children. What a dumb thing to say. But again, in rage... They were so deceived, and yet this is what the charge is going on right here. Well, there's no deception here, because back in chapter 4, Peter and J uh, 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 John had already been arrested by these same guys. And when after they were warned, basically Peter was the one that said, well, should we obey God or you? Take a wild guess at the answer to that one. Who is the highest power in your life? Who are you going to obey? Is it going to be you, your neighbor, your friend, your spouse, your friend? Or is it going to be God himself? Well, Peter goes on and he, he nails them. and says, and Peter the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. 
We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Peter basically says, you were the ones that rejected Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, God's provision for our forgiveness. And what was your opinion of Jesus? Deuteronomy 21 verse 23 says, you hang somebody on a tree on a cross, you're basically asking God to curse that man. So we're here, you crucified Jesus. You wanted God to curse him. Let me tell you what God wanted to do. Verse 30, God raised him from the dead. Verse 31, God exalted him to his right hand. Verse 32, God sent his Holy Spirit so we could have an intimate relationship with our creator. And it was all because Jesus made it happen. Verse 32. Well, I've had people not appreciate my preaching. <laughs> but I haven't had anybody want to kill me yet. Yet. But notice verse 33. When they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them all, all these apostles, to death. They wanted them gone. So what happens here? Well, Satan, this is his full-blown attempt to destroy the church. Because if he can kill and destroy these apostles, the foundation of the church, he's destroyed the church. Yeah, it was very interesting about this whole thing is the question comes up. Didn't I hear Jesus say in Matthew 16, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Here's the gates of hell wanting to basically destroy the beginning of the church. And this was going to come from hell. Satan himself. You say, but what do you mean Satan? I mean, these are people beating up people. People arresting people. People are the ones that punish people. Why do you have to say, well, this is Satan? Well, I've always said that indeed. What is the worst thing Judas ever did. What's the dumbest thing Judas ever did? Not a difficult question. He betrayed Jesus Christ. Now, if you're going to betray somebody, don't betray the guy who walks on water or stops the storms. He can hurt you. I mean, you've got other lugs to betray. Bartholomew, Matthew, Peter, John. Don't betray Jesus. So where does he get that idea? Remember in John's Gospel, chapter 13, verse 2 says, and Satan put it into the heart of Judas to betray Christ. Apparently, a spiritual being like Lucifer can actually implant thoughts and desires, deep thoughts, deep desires in the heart of a human being. You do remember, not all thoughts are your own. And you sit there and go, well, I'll do whatever comes to my mind. Well, welcome to the world of being a puppet. <laughs> because you don't have any ideas. I get thoughts and I think, well, well, you know, I... You get thoughts what you ought to do to your mother-in-law. And you go, I don't think that's from God, you know? <laughs> and I'm not sure it's from the devil or my flesh. But the fact still is, not all thoughts are your own. And so Satan's attack of the church that Jesus Christ is building is, of course, he's going to use people. People are not the problem. Like I said, the most disbelieved verse, Ephesians 6, 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but harassing forces of darkness who implant the thoughts, who implant the desires, the deception, the lies in people, and people will bring the persecution. But it is still authored by the devil himself. So you pick it up in verse 34. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. He wants to talk to the boys. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin. Now, who is this Gamaliel? He, he bore the title Rabban. You talk to any of your Jewish friends, still venerated as one of the great Jewish rabbis of all time. And he stands up before his peers, and basically he says, back off. Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Thutos appeared, claiming to be someone, and about 400 men rallied to him, and he was killed. All his followers were dispersed, and it came to nothing. After that, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census. He led a band of people in revolt, and he too was killed. And all his followers were scattered. Josephus, Flavius Josephus, who lived at that time and wrote of this season, said there are literally hundreds upon hundreds of revolts and false teachers and false messiahs trying to get a following. And either they just faded off or Rome basically crushed them and killed them. So what his argument is basically this is stay away and let them alone. 
If this is not of God, it will fade away like the others have. Or Rome will get here of it. And Rome will crush it and kill it like everybody else they did. But he says, if this is of God, uh we don't want to be on the wrong side of this thing. So he continues in verse 38. He says, therefore, at the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it's going to fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourself fighting against God. Isn't that an interesting prophetic statement? His speech persuaded them. Great persuasion. So they called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. <laughs> That's interesting. He, 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 he tells them, let them go. Back off. So they say, okay, let's let them go. But let's first beat the spit out of them. They wanted these apostles to suffer. And so it said they flogged them. That meant they received 39 lashes each. The reason it was 39 is because it was felt that 40 would kill you. Now, here's the part that I don't get. The last couple of verses of this account, the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, that what bothers me is they left this rejoicing this is what they figured ended up being a good day? Getting uh, beaten? You know, we talk about trusting God a lot. I don't know if I can trust God in this. You know, I just lost my job. I don't know if I can trust God's love. You know, I just got a bad grade for this. I don't know if I can trust God. Right here, they're flipping around. They're rejoicing because they knew they proved that God could trust them. In other words, they were willing to take a beating for Jesus Christ. And they had a chance to prove it. That's what they were rejoicing about. You know, I was a kid. I was just really a skinny, funny looking little kid. I know, I, I saw a video of me as a kid. And I thought, somebody hit the kid. I shake whiz. And I, I, I uh, but I had a big mouth. Oh, I know it's hard for you to believe it. I had a big mouth. It was my only defense. And sometimes it worked. And sometimes it just got a beaten for me. And so I was willing to take a beating for a big mouth. But, but am I willing to take a beating for something else? Well, it all begins now in chapter 6, 7, and 8. Later in chapter 7, you have a young man named Stephen. He ends up being the first martyr. Young man. And he, 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 he won't back down. He preaches the gospel and the changed life. And they murder him. Chapter 7, verse 54 and 60 is the account. They put him to death. He's the first Christian martyr in the scripture. Stephen. Interesting, his name means victorious crown. But then it really begins big time after that day in Acts chapter 1, verse. Acts chapter 8, verse 1. On that day, what day? The day that Stephen was executed. A great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Why? Why would God permit a persecution to break out in Jerusalem? Well, remember what Jesus said in Acts 1.8? You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, and we're going further out than that. And yet they're all sticking around Jerusalem. So God knew the only way he could scatter them to share the gospel was go ahead and to permit, not produce, but to permit this persecution. And so it all begins. But it's interesting, it did not begin with Rome or government persecution. It began in these little towns and villages. Because what happened is Christians would have a little church in a village. And, and that particular year, the rains didn't fall. And, and, and the crops died. And you had no crops. And who do you blame? Well, who got the gods who bring the rain to produce the crops? Who got these gods angry? It's these Christians. And because of the Christians, they would be blamed because they got all these, these pagan gods angry because they didn't believe in pagan gods. And so they would be persecuted in these villages. A kid, a child would fall into a fire. Some accident would happen. Some injury would transpire. Who gets blamed? 
Well, our local pagan gods apparently got angry. And why did they get angry? Because these Christians won't worship them. And they say there's only one God. It's these Christians' fault. And Christians would be persecuted in the most horrific ways. But it all began in the local villages for the first, well, for the first 50, 60 years. But now you get to around AD 64 and Nero has that big barbecue. Uh, Nero, most of Rome was made out of wood and he wanted to, to build new buildings in honor of himself. So he set the, the city of Rome to, to fire. Remember the old fiddle deal? But of course, it kind of backfired in a sense that people knew he had done that. And so now he's got to find a scapegoat. So he blames the Christians because they preached about at the end times, God will bring judgment and there'll be fire. And so he blames the Christians for this fire. And this is when you read of the horrific things that happened to the Christians there with the wild animals having their flesh torn from their body in the games among the gladiators and the people and Nero himself. And it didn't stop there. That's when Nero would actually take bodies of believers and put pitch, tar on them, set them in the flame, put them on poles so they would light up the gardens of Nero. That's what it was like to be a Christian at that time. Then social media. Talk about bullying people. Boy, Christians got accused for everything. They, they got accused for cannibalism. They were accused for immorality as well as being accused for arson as scapegoats. No, they never set any flame to Rome. What's this cannibalism thing? Oh, it was leaking out that these Christians would gather together for communion. And they would take bread and they'd break the bread to remember, as Paul said, to remember the broken body of Jesus. And they'd take the fruit of the vine, wine, and they would drink to remember that it was the blood of Christ that was the covenant that God promised that he would give us forgiveness and have a relationship with us as his sons and daughters. Ah, oh, but you want to know what leaked out through social media? These Christians are eating flesh and they're drinking blood. And guess where they're getting the flesh and the blood? They're stealing our babies and they are killing the babies and they're eating the flesh of the babies and drinking the blood of the babies. And so what are you going to do about that, Rome? Now, were they eating the flesh and drinking the blood of babies? No! The reason I have to do that is in the first service, somebody thought, did they really do that? No! <laughs> but that was what was going on in social media. And they were actually being accused of cannibalism. Immorality. Talk about the self-righteousness of the Romans. What do you mean immorality? Oh, we've heard these Christians gather together for their love feast. Their agape feast. The love, a love, a love feast. And we all know what you do at those love feasts. You perverts. And so therefore, Christians were even being labeled. Now, were they being perverts in these love? No. They gathered together and served and cared and worshiped and studied the word of God together. And they called it the agape feast. But media got it out. And boy, Christians began to have the whole population turn against them based on lies. It hasn't really changed much throughout the history. In my world, universities... I, I have some friends that, that told me there's certain universities, you, if you're a Christian, you cannot apply into their PhD program in science or psychology. Because by definition, if you believe in a God and you believe Jesus Christ is your Savior and Lord, you have, quote, mental illness. And they will not permit you into their PhD programs. Oh, it just goes on and on in all different forms and all different ways. Paul says, and indeed, all who desire to live godly in Jesus Christ will be persecuted. Not my favorite verse. But why would God even permit persecution? Why would he let it happen? I mean, when we come to Christ, where's the Teflon? It just seems like God will want to protect us once we become his children. Yeah, but he didn't do it for Jesus. Why do you think he'd do it for us? It's like God has some kind of thought, some kind of purpose and pain. Oh, oh, yeah. You see, the greater pain you feel, it is the only way your capacity for feeling can be stretched. Because when you are in suffering and pain, you feel, you feel deeper than you've ever felt before. You feel pain greater. But when that pain is resolved, you are left with a greater capacity for compassion. For wisdom, 
for understanding. Think of the most surface, shallow people you know that are totally intolerant of everything. I'll tell you one thing. They haven't suffered very much. God knows that. That's why there's no wasted pain. That's not why there's no purposeless tear. God puts the purpose in the pain. And because he wants us to have the compassion of his own son, he will permit the devil, Satan, to bring persecution on his people to carry out what God ultimately wants. Because God pulls good out of the messes we create for ourselves. And in God's sovereign wisdom, he pulls good out of the messes other people create for us. So that's why God permits it to happen, but sure doesn't make it easier. So what do we do? First, never compare your suffering or your persecution with someone else. Satan knows exactly what he needs to do to you to try to get you to walk away from Christ, to try to get you to destroy your faith. And none of us is going to be the same. And Paul, God, Paul promises that he will, with every temptation, provide a way for you to escape, but for every single one, it's different. So don't be comparing, well, I suffer more than you, because that's not true. Suffering is very sacred, and it's very personal. But how we deal with it's all the same. You remember again in Ephesians 6, 12, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but harassing forces of darkness. He goes on in the rest of the chapter. We don't have time to take a lot of time. But let me just summarize it for you in Ephesians chapter 6 and study it. Ephesians chapter 6. Because that's where he says, now put on the full armor of God. Paul's under house arrest. He's chained up to a Roman soldier. He looks at his weapons and he looks at his armor and he says, we've got the same armor against persecution, against the affront of Satan himself. And he says, you know, there's three things you just need to remember when you get hit with a persecution. And there's three things you need to do. And he calls these the six weapons, the six uh, 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 armor of, of the Spirit of God. The first six, he says, stand firm. Remember, these things are already there. Just remember them. First, you have already been girded with the loins of truth. Well, what's that? I've been girded. That's the belt. So it holds everything together so your tunic doesn't fall down, you know? The, the, the belt of truth. What truth? You know the truth about Jesus. You, you don't think you figured that out on your own. There are brilliant people who believe in Jesus Christ. There's brilliant people who don't. There's num-nums who believe in Jesus Christ, and there's num-nums who don't. It's not an algorithm. A little Jewish guy, what? Five foot eight, God in a bod, created the heavens and the earth, executed by Rome, and that's a sacrifice for your sins to be forgiven, and you get to go to heaven. Do you really expect me to believe a story like that? But I do. Because what Jesus said in John 6, verse 44 and 45, when Jesus says, I know no one will recognize me, he says, no one will come to me unless the Father himself draws him. For the prophets say, I will learn of Jesus from my Father in heaven, from the Father of heaven. It's the Father who caused you to recognize the truth of who Jesus was. His Son and the Christ, his provision for our forgiveness. He says, first remember, you know who Jesus is. Second of all, when you get to temptation and you're starting to get mocked, hurt, persecuted in some way for your faith, put on the breastplate of righteousness. Not even put it on, it's already on you. This breastplate this of righteousness is in a right relationship with God as your heavenly father. It's remembering what Paul said. God said, I'll be a father to you. You'll be sons and daughters to me. The point is don't sit there and go, Oh, no, God must be punishing me. Oh, God must be mad at me. Oh, I'm being persecuted because I've done something wrong and God has abandoned me. God does not abandon his children. So remember who Jesus is. And he's done what he's done. He's been persecuted and sacrificed for you. You remember who you are. You're a child, a son, a daughter of the heavenly father. He's not punishing you. Satan is going after you. Then thirdly, your feet shod with peace. Boy, Romans, they had little nails at the end of their feet so they could really fight and not be slipping in the mud. Here's this peace. This is Romans 8.1. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. No, you're not being punished by God. No, God is not angry at you. So he says, first of all, when persecution comes, first remember who Jesus is, remember who you are, and remember your relationship with both. You're at peace. You're not under punishment. 
That's persecution taking place. Now he says, act. Now he says, take up the shield of faith, helmet of salvation, sword of the spirit. What's this? The shield of the faith. The word shield is the word thuron. It's like a big, means door. It's a big thing. You get behind this shield. And when the fiery darts come of the attacks and persecution, you get behind the shield of faith. That is, you're going to choose God to trust God for something. God, I just lost my job. That one really hurt. God, my, my, my wife's really angry at me. God, God, God I, I, I may not be able to get into this program, this school. I, I, what are you going to trust him for? God, I'm going to get behind the shield of faith. And God, I'm going to trust your will be done. If I'm not to have that job, I don't want the job. If I'm not in that program, I don't want to be in the program. God, I will trust you. That's the shield of faith. I, what am I going to trust him to do? And in the helmet of salvation, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, this is the salvation of hope. So now he says, now when you get hit with persecution, what are you hoping for? Are you hoping for the will of God? Are you hoping you might become more like Christ? What are you hoping for here? Now, last of all, the machiron, the sword of the spirit. In other words, give the spirit of God vocabulary. My question, gentlemen, when did ignorance become a virtue? Well, my wife knows all that Bible stuff. I'm just fully masculine, manly man, stupid. <laughs> and if you don't give the words of the Spirit for the Spirit to be able to speak to you, all he can do is make you feel guilty, feel ashamed, because you've muted him. Romans 8, 16 says, Don't you know it's the Holy Spirit who bears witness with your spirit, your children of God. And the more vocabulary you give him by the more scriptures, his words you know, he can speak to you on why the persecution and what God is trying to do and what you ought to be hoping for. This is why the swords, the very words of God. So it comes down to this persecution, yeah. I guess that's real. In all different forms. God permits it. Why? Oh, it makes us more like Christ. It just stretches out our capacity to feel compassion, wisdom, understanding. But Satan's behind the whole thing. So I guess it really comes down to just one question. Who am I willing to take a beating for? Apparently, they were willing to take a beating for Jesus Christ. How about me? I know I'm willing to take a beating for Holly. When we were younger, we were married to 48 years, and we were younger, I said, nobody could ever touch this woman without me first. Now, last 10 years, I've taught Holly how to run fast because the <laughs> best I can do is probably slow them down, and that's about it, but they will have to trip over me. <laughs> I'll take a beating for our boys. I'll take a beating for our grandchildren. Livia's going to be 17. And I seriously took her down, said, I said, Livy, let me understand. Sugar Pops, that's what she calls, Sugar Pops is not afraid of prison. <laughs> and I'll tell you, I'll just go and start a prison ministry. It'll be just fine. <laughs> what court is going to put me to death for a grandfather taking out somebody who broke his granddaughter's heart? I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> so I'm willing to take a beating for my grandchildren. But what about Jesus Christ? My dad used to say, don't go out looking for a fight, but never run from one. That advice got me beaten up a lot. <laughs> but my dad was never that wise anyway. <laughs> but does make me think, Daryl, who are you willing to take a beating for? Am I willing to take a beating for one who took a beating for me? Am I willing to take a beating for one who sacrificed everything, his place in heaven, to come down here to be persecuted, beaten, to be hated, all so that I could have my sinfulness forgiven, my arrogance, my pride, the cosmic treason of turning my back on God, all washed away, and his spirit placed within me Bring me into being a son, a child with a heavenly father, with a destiny. How could I ever say I would not take a beating for him? And I guess that's the decision this morning. If 
For each one of us, it's going to be something different, but it will be a beating. And we better just make up our mind right now so that we don't get angry, we don't get bitter. It's not this, why me? Why not me? <laughs> Phrase I use, my turn. <laughs> but when is it going to be your turn? Because it will be your turn. Are you ready now? I've had to make this decision three times this morning. You can make it once. <laughs> I am willing. I'm willing to take a beating for Jesus Christ in whatever form that takes. How about you? Heavenly Father, I ask that you would give us the courage to make that covenant. And Lord, when the day comes that we, like these, get to demonstrate you can trust us when we say that, that we would actually rejoice at the privilege of showing you the depths of our loyalty and our love and appreciation of who you are and what you've done for us. This we are asking in the name of Jesus Christ. And God's people said, amen. amen.